Hello, plant taxonomists. We are here to talk about Lamiaceae. This is known as the mint family. Now, when you think mint, you probably think, oh, something that smells pretty good, if you like that smell, that is. Um, but they don't always smell uh, good in this family. So this is something I tend to call stinky steakies. It's also known as hedge nettle. It smells really bad, but it does smell. Um, one of the family features is that they tend to have aromatic compounds. Now, they don't always. Now, not everything in this family has a smell at all. So we, uh, by the way, we're not picking up any genera in this family. The only thing that's required is the family. You just need to know family traits. So check this out. Do you recognize this? Maybe those leaves? If you were able to smell it, you would for sure recognize it, I'm sure. Um, this is rosemary. And those leaves are used in cooking a lot of times. Actually, lots of ethno but. <laughs> Lots of ethnobotany in this family. We've got things like uh, thyme, chia seeds, uh, lavender, catnip, mints, of course, rosemary, um, all sorts of things. Check out those flowers, though. Very fancy. Here's sort of the look. Um, members of Lamiaceae tend to not get too too big. We don't see we don't see trees. We don't see um, too many woody shrubs. Some some sort of woody shrubs in this family, but usually we see herbs. These are oftentimes perennial herbs, something like that. Now notice how we can see kind of both in the herbarium specimen and in the photo here, the flowers are sort of in clusters um, in the axles of leaves. So. <clears throat> First of all, we can tell uh, from this picture that we've got opposite leaves. Well, right in the axles, there are these little tiny dense cymes, and they sort of make the whole plant look like they have flowers and stacks on top of one another. You see that? They kind of have that layered look. That is a very common uh, look of the family. It's one of those really good identification features. They call that a verticillate inflorescence, like kind of like vertically held verticillate inflorescence. But technically, they're their signs. Oh, something else we oops we can see from this picture is the uh, down here, Labiati. That's the old family name. Um, labia it means lip, and there's something about the corollas here that have to do with lips that we're going to talk about here in a sec. After I show you just some little bit of eye candy in the family. Um, these are some. This is a really nice picture that I just found on the internet. You can really see that stacked look of the flowers. And another one that's the same one as the intro slide here. Okay, one really good identification feature is looking at the stem. When you hold it, can you roll it around in your fingers and feel four edges? Does this sound familiar? Does it remind you of the Urtica video? Yes, it turns out, oops, the stem of the mint family, if we were to do a cross section like that, the stem would be square, just like an Urtica. So, the leaf shape is very similar to Urtica as well. The, the margin is similar. They can both be very um, hairy. So what are some identification features that you would be able to use between Stinging Nettle, Urtica, and the mint family, Lamiaceae? Because they both have opposite leaves and square stems. So I'll let you think about that. And yes, one way to tell the difference, I suppose, would be to touch them. Mint will not sting you. But that's not always the best way to identify things. Sometimes we like to um, not let it get to that point. Just wanted to, again, show you some sort of eye candy. Lamy ACE has an impressive amount of floral diversity. Although they all have the same floral setup, we're about to talk about the floral formula and sort of the corolla shape. But please, just, just stare at these. We've got some really beautiful flowers. Um, all sorts of pollination syndromes, definitely some... Some moths, some hummingbirds, some moths, uh, I said moths, uh, bees, all the, all the uh, pollination syndromes that you can imagine. Maybe hold bats, not, none that I know of at least. This thing on the right in this image is lamb's ear, you might have heard of that. Huge variety of floral shapes, but they are all going to come in this form. Notice how in this diagram, we can pretty clearly see that the corolla is fused. We have fused petals. Those fused petals are sort of forming an upper lip. What I just, eh, that's a bad color. Sort of a, oopsies, an upper lip here, right? And then sort of like a lower lip down here. So all of the petals, of which there are five that are fused, they're sort of forming this upper lip of the two fused petals and then the lower lip of the um, three fused petals. All of them are fused together though, all five of those. But they sort of, um, they sort of call for a two plus three uh, fused 
uh, symbol for their corolla part of the floral formula. <clears throat> but more importantly right now, there's a term for this kind of tulipped flower. Not tulip, not a tulip. That's a, that's a, a genus of flowers. Um, I'm talking about a two, T-W-O, lipped flower. This is called the bilabiates. So that root labia means lip by two. Um, this flower sort of has two lips. Cool. So let's do a quick floral formula. This is consistent for the whole family. Um, can you tell the symmetry? I bet you can. Yes, indeed. Zygomorphic. And we've actually got five fused sepals. We can't see that yet in this picture, but I'll show you in one of the next few pictures. We do have five fused petals, but let's do the two plus three thing. This implies bilabiate. Two plus three fused. Now, the andresium comes in one of two forms in the family. They usually either have two or four stamens. Those two or four stamens will be fused to the corolla. They have epipetalous stamens in this family, whether it's two or four. Now also sometimes, by the way, there are some staminodes in this family from time to time. All of those things would be fused to the corolla. It's a family trait. Gynesium, two, fused, superior. Kind of classic gynesium. All right, let's move on and talk about that gynesium. I just told you it's two fused, right? Do you believe me? Probably not. This looks like four unfused. Yeah, well, it's actually not. It's actually two fused, believe it or not. What we have going on here is, yeah, the exact same thing that we saw in Boraginaceae. Literally the exact same thing. We have, say, one carpal right here and another carpal right here. Each of them is deeply lobed within and between the carpals. And so it looks like four. But really, um, these are, this is just one ovary that is deeply four lobed and it has one, two, three, four seeds associated with this ovary. Now, you can kind of see in this tiny picture up here, there is a long style. It's been removed from this lower picture, but if the style was attached, it would have been attached right here and sort of elongate like that. <clears throat> kind of coming out of the middle of those four deep ovary lobes. Do you remember the term from this from for Baraginaceae? This sort of style attachment is called a gynobasic style. That's a G-Y-N-O. Gynobasic style. Cool. And yeah, if you're thinking that this is a schizocarp, it is. You're correct. And we actually even use the same term for the maricarps as we do in Baraginaceae. We call them nutlets. Fabulous. There they are. There are their nutlets. Now, something I forgot to mention earlier has to do with the calyx. I did tell you that the calyx is fused. All five of those sepals are fused. Here's something else about the calyx. It's persistent. It sticks around after the flower. So what we're looking at here are four developed nutlets inside of their persistent calyx little fortress there. It's, it's great. Um, the persistent calyx really aids in sort of hanging on to those nutlets. It sort of acts like a capsule almost uh, when, when you consider them all together. Um, there's just a, a better look at that calyx in the flower here. So the calyx is clearly fused and it sticks around. So up here, these are probably some older uh, flower or older parts of the plant that have lost their corolla and they're probably forming nutlets. If we were to open this up, I'm sure we would see four developing nutlets in there inside of that persistent calyx. All right, and this is my last slide. Uh, this is just uh, one of my favorite native members of the mint family, Monardella. And you can find this up in the Trinity Alps and all, all around, say, the Trinity River. And it smells amazing. It's really, really intense, though. It kind of gives you a high. And so if you find this thing, you'll definitely be able to recognize it by its really intense, sweet mint smell. And um, kind of just be careful. Don't huff it right away. Make sure that it doesn't kind of hit you too hard great kind of natural high out there when you're hiking. It's really fun. Okay, well, thanks for listening, and I'll see you again real soon.